Ash provides some handy shortcuts called expansions, and you may already be familiar with one of them that is called. If you've ever used the tilde character to represent your home directory, you've used tilde expansion. The tilde character represents the value of the user's home variable. The tilde followed by a dash or minus represents the bash variable called old pwd, which is the directory that you were just in if you've recently changed directories. There are some other features as well, and I encourage you to check out the documentation for tilde expansion to learn more. I'll step into the fruit directory here. Another handy type of expansion is called brace expansion. This is written with braces around an expression, and it can help with repeated commands with different terms or interpolation within a range. Let's say I wanted to create a bunch of files, but I didn't want to type each command to do so. With brace expansion, I can type touch apple, banana, cherry, durian, and I can see that that created four files. Of course, I could do that with touch just by itself, but I can use interpolation for things that I really don't want to type out each time. Let's say I want to create a thousand files. It would be a little tedious to touch each of those individually, so I can type touch, and then the beginning of the file name, file underscore, this can be whatever you want, one dot dot one thousand, and close the brace, and then when I list the directory, there's a thousand new files. Now, the upper limit of this range seems to vary by platform. On my Mac, I can get up to about 14,340. My Linux machine here goes much higher than that. But that's not really the point. Bash version 4 added the ability to pad these series of numbers with zero. Normally, if I asked for the numbers 1 through 10, I'd get this. But if I started naming files like this, they wouldn't sort the way you might want, as you saw before. For example, file 428, file 429, file 43, file 430. Of course, that's not an incorrect sort. There is a logic to it. But like I said, it may not be what you expect. I can fix that with zero padding, but first let me clear out all these files, and I'll create new files. Notice the zero in front of the one. It doesn't matter how many places you need to pad, one zero is all it takes. So now the files sort the way I'd expect, and they all have the same file name length. As of bash 4, you can also specify an interval. I'll clear the screen here, and then I'll type echo and curly brace 1 dot dot 10 dot dot 2. In this case, I'll get the numbers between 1 and 10 counting by 2s, or 3s, or any absolute value integer you might need. Brace expansion works with letters as well. As you can see, the capital letters come before the lowercase letters, with a couple symbols in between. And like I mentioned, with bash 4 and above, you can specify an interval with letters as well. Brace expansion will interpret the range that you give it. So, as an example, I said w dot dot d, which is not only backwards, but it's also a subrange of the alphabet. If you do use this in your scripts, make sure to keep in mind that your target audience may not have this feature available if they're on certain platforms. And I can chain together these expressions as well. I'll get rid of all of those files I created just a minute ago, and type clear to clear up the screen. And then I'll create a series of files, named with a fruit, underscore, a number, underscore, and a lowercase letter. And suddenly I have thousands of files. In fact, I can take the output of ls-1 and pipe it into wc-l, which is a word count, with the dash l flag giving me the line count. And I can see I have 8,000 files. Obviously, this has applications beyond file creation, and it's important to be able to recognize when it's being used and when to use it. A lot of what you'll be doing with scripts involves getting something to go somewhere else. Bash has a couple ways of doing this. First, let's look at pipes. Piping takes the result of one command and sends or pipes it into another command. For example, take a look at the result of listing the contents of this directory, which has a lot of things in it from the previous movie. That's a bunch of stuff. It would be nice to take that output and display it page by page. I can do this by piping the output of ls into the more command. And if you're looking for the pipe character, it's usually shift backslash. The key for which on most keyboards is right above the return key. But your keyboard might vary. And now, I can take advantage of Moore's pagination. Redirection, on the other hand, works with a standard input, standard output, and standard error. That is, the input from the command line environment, the output to it, and the errors that arise when something goes wrong. Let's set up a little bit of an example here. First, I'll make another folder to copy to. And I'll make it so that I don't have access to read some of the files in this current folder. This will cause some errors later on, and that's what I want. So I'll copy these files into the other folder. The V here tells the CP command to be verbose, so we see each copy operation and I'm specifying star to use file name expansion to match all of the files. Then, I'm using the two dots and a slash in the destination path to indicate that other folder is a child of this folder's parent folder. That is, the cp command will have to go up a folder level to find other folder. And if I scroll up here, there's some errors. I couldn't copy some files, the ones named with 015, which you remember I blocked everyone from reading, and the other files copied just fine. So, I'll clear the screen. I'll get rid of everything in that other folder. I'll write another command here, and I'll explain it in just a minute. These numbers, 1 and 2, represent the standard output and standard error, respectively. The greater than symbol represents redirecting the output from each of those somewhere else. So the successes will go to a file called success.txt, and the errors will go into a file called error.txt. I'm putting them one level up, so if I want to run this command again, I won't be copying my success and error files into the other folder. 
And that time there was no feedback. That's because I redirected both regular messages that would normally appear at the standard output and the errors to text files instead. This can be pretty handy if you want to capture the outputs of commands that you're running. Let's take a look at these files. I'll type cat dot dot slash success dot txt and then cat dot dot slash error dot txt. Cool. I'll clear out that folder again. You can also tell Bash to redirect standard output and standard error to the same place. Here, using the ampersand to represent both 1 and 2. And I can see that everything's there. You can also redirect to a special location called dev null if you just want to get rid of and ignore the output from a command. For example, I could redirect the output of ls to dev null, and the results just go off into the great blue nowhere, never to be seen again. There's a handy tool called grep, which lets you search files for specific patterns of text. This can come in handy when you're searching through log files or if you just want to get one piece of output from a command that returns a lot of information. Of course, there's way, way too much cool stuff that grep does for me to cover in this movie, but I'll show you a couple examples. If you want to learn more about what grep can do, check out its man page with the command man grep. So first, let's take a look at a log file. I've got a log file here called auth.log. It's a modified version of an authentication log from a computer that was left exposed to the internet for a few days. It's got a whole bunch of failed login attempts from different addresses, and it's over 18,000 lines long. Not something you'd want to have to scroll through by hand. Now, of course, I've changed the addresses to example values, so the IPs and servers you see don't exist on the internet. So I could use nano or cat to see the contents, but I want to search for my username. So I'll clear the screen here. So I'll use grep followed by the search term, in this case my username, followed by the name of the file that I want to work with, auth.log. Notice how the search term is highlighted. You may not see this on your system. I like to enable the color output because it makes things stand out a bit more. You can use the color option, that's dash dash color equals auto, on individual lines, or you can type export grep underscore options, all caps, equals apostrophe dash dash color equals auto to enable it all the time. So let's clear the screen and get back to the log. Now I'll look for access attempts that the system thinks is a break-in. Here I'm using dash i to make my search case insensitive, and there's all the break-in attempts. I can pipe this output into a command called awk to extract just a list of specific things. In my case, I want a list of IP addresses. What this print statement does is to count the twelfth thing that it comes across, line by line, space delimited, and only return that value. So I have print dollar sign twelve, which will return one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. The twelfth thing, right there. It's the IP address in brackets. Awk is powerful. And there's another program called SED, SED, that you'll see used all over the place for string manipulation within bash scripts. I encourage you to explore the man pages for them both, with man awk and man said, to become familiar with them. But since they're beyond the scope of bash itself, I won't cover them in depth here. So, okay, that's using grep directly on a file, but what about using it to pull specific information out of the output of a command? Let's take a look at that using the ping command. Now you're probably familiar with ping. It's really handy for checking if you have network connectivity and for getting an idea of the response time for a particular server or device. But sometimes I just want one ping to check something really quickly, rather than letting the command run until I stop it with Control c of course, ping has an option for this, the dash C flag, to set the count of the pings that it sends. But it still outputs a bunch of other information, and all I'm interested in is the response time. So to get that, I can pipe the output of ping into grep. In this case, I'll look for bytes from. Alright, this is getting closer, I just have one line. So to get where I want, I'll pipe the result of grep into a command called cut, which lets you slice up lines based on particular criteria. For this, I'll use the D flag, which lets me specify a delimiter. In this case, I'll use the equal sign, and I'll follow that up with dash F4, because I want field 4. Similar to how awk works, this value will go along the line that I give it, and look for the delimiter, which is equals, and then it'll find the fourth thing that's delimited with equals. This here is all one thing, then you have a delimiter. This is a second thing, delimiter. This is a third thing, delimiter, and then the fourth thing. And there it is. Now, of course, this is a pretty long and unwieldy command to use all the time, and you're probably seeing that it would be really handy to be able to change certain values within that command programmatically, and that's exactly where we're headed. So in a later movie, I'll show you how to wrap it up in a script to make it more convenient and versatile. While bash refers to the whole interactive shell, most of the time we just issue single commands, ls, cd, rm, grep, and things like that. A bash script can contain many of these commands and often makes use of variables, arguments, and procedural flow control logic. Of course, you can enter these things line by line at the command prompt, but the whole point of having scripts is that you don't have to do that. Your script will start with an interpreter directive that's sometimes called a hash bang or shebang. That nickname comes from the first two characters of the line, a number or pound sign or hash sign, and an exclamation mark, which is sometimes called bang. That's followed by the path to the bash executable, and this can vary on different systems, but usually it'll be at bin bash. 
The hash or number sign is the comment signifier in bash. If you put it at the beginning of a line, the interpreter ignores the text on that line. Together with the exclamation mark and a path to the bash binary, the whole line tells the shell that this is a bash script and should be run as such. This is especially important when you mark your script as executable, which we'll take a look at in more detail later. After the first line, we get into the rest of the script. Bash can be picky about whitespace within expressions, but it doesn't mind whitespace in indentations and between lines. So now we're ready to create a script. Frequently, if you're creating or editing a bash script, you'll be doing so in a terminal window. I'm using the nano editor here on my system, and I'll create a file by typing nano my.sh. The .sh on the end signifies that it's a shell script, and of course we'll want to put the shebang line in first. Next, I'll add a comment to describe what the script does. It's a good practice to document things as you write them, so you're not faced with coming back months or years later and trying to figure out what a script is for. At this point, we're ready to write something that does something, and as it turns out, we already know a whole bunch of bash commands. Let's just use a basic one for now. That's just the command to list the current directory, so we know what to expect out of the script. I'll save the file with Control-O, and then exit, which is Control-X. Back at the command line, if I type ls, I can see that I've got the script here. But I can't just type the name of the script to run it. I have to use an interpreter for that. So I can type bash my.sh. And we see the contents of this folder, just like we'd expect. But most of the time, you won't want to type out bash in front of your script. So let's take advantage of that shebang line, which tells the system where the bash interpreter is. I'll type chmod plus x my.sh to make the script executable. And now I can just run it by typing dot slash my.sh. We need the dot slash since the current working directory isn't part of the path environment variable. If we put this script somewhere that is, like user bin, then I can run it just by typing a name. But we wouldn't really want to do that in practice, and that's getting a little ahead of ourselves. Of course, now I can do nano my.sh and jump back into the script and make changes if I need to. But for now, let's leave it as is. One of the most basic commands that you'll use in a bash script is the echo command. Echo prints out information, normally to the standard output, but it can be directed elsewhere. The syntax for the echo command is pretty simple. You just type echo, followed by whatever you want to output. However, there are a couple different things you should keep in mind about quote marks. There's three conditions to be aware of here. No quotes, single quotes, and double quotes. Here's a simple example. Don't worry about the greeting stuff for now. That's a variable, and we'll dig into those soon. If you write a statement with no quotes, Bash goes along and interprets things as it finds them. I got an error here, because if you need to use special characters, you have to escape them with a backslash. There's also single quotes, or strong quotes, where nothing inside of the quotes gets interpreted, so everything comes out literally. Even if I put a variable inside, I get back literally what I typed, not the variable. And finally, there's a middle way, using double quotes. I'll turn these all on so we can see the differences. Of course, if you wanted to have bash display something literally inside of double quotes, you could escape it with a backslash. If you want to add empty lines to your output, just type echo with nothing after it. I'll be using echo throughout the rest of the course. For now, let's move on to using variables. As with any language, you'll probably find yourself needing to work with variables in your scripts. They're named with a sequence of alphanumeric characters, and the names must start with a letter. To declare a variable, I'll type its name directly followed with an equal sign, directly followed with a value. Note that there's no spaces. If you put spaces around the equal sign, you'll get an error when you run the script. Likewise, if your variable is a string with spaces in it, such as good morning, you'll need to put that string in quotes in the variable declaration. Of course, a variable could also be a number. So to use these variables, we call them with a dollar sign in front of their name. So I'll save that, and I'll run it at the command line. And we can see the values printed out there. These variables also work inside of other variables or strings if they're double quoted. And again, I'll save and run. And here I have a string that has variables included in it. Of course, that can be very handy for generating output to the standard out, for a string you use in a file name or something like that, or to a log file. You can give variables special attributes if you like using the declare keyword. Declare i in front of the variable marks that variable as an integer. Declare r before a variable marks it as a read only. That means that it can't be modified later arithmetically or with string manipulation. You can also convert arbitrary strings to lowercase or uppercase with dash l and dash u respectively. There are some special variables to be aware of too. I've listed a few of them here with the output from both my Mac and my Linux machine. There's home, which returns the user's home directory, pwd, which returns the current directory, just like the lowercase pwd command does at the bash command line, 
mock type, which returns the machine type, which could come in handy for determining file locations if you're writing a script to work on different platforms. There's host name, which returns the system name, bash underscore version, which returns the version of bash running on the box, and seconds, which returns the number of seconds a bash session has been running. If you type echo seconds at the command line, you'll see how long that session has been open. But if you use seconds in a script, it'll start counting from when the script started. That can be handy for timing things. Another variable, $0, contains the name of the script. There's a bunch more too, and you can explore them here. Variables are everywhere in scripts, so it's important to have a good handle on them. Chances are, you'll probably want to get some information back from commands you write in a bash script, instead of just running them. Luckily, it's very easy with command substitution. That's accomplished using a dollar sign with parentheses around a command, in this case, pwd, which prints the working directory. What this does is run the command inside the parentheses and assigns the result to the variable specified, in this case, d. Without the command substitution stuff around pwd, the value would just be pwd. I'll put that back, and I'll save the script, and then I'll run it. So that's a pretty basic example, but let's take a look at another one. At some point in your script writing adventures, you'll want to use the value of some complex command. As an example, let's take a look at finding out how long it takes to get a response from a server. You may recognize this command from an earlier movie. What matters here is that I'm setting the variable a to the result of this command line statement. So if I run this command, I see the result. But now it's available as a variable within my script that I can use for other operations. Working with numbers in bash is pretty straightforward. To tell the interpreter that you're going to do math, you need to wrap an expression up in double parentheses. If you're assigning the result of an arithmetic expression to a variable, the parens need to start with a dollar sign. The expression inside the parentheses can use either literal numbers or variables. Bash supports six basic arithmetic operators. Exponentiation with double asterisks, multiplication with a single asterisk, division with a forward slash, modulo with a percent sign, addition with a plus, and subtraction with a minus. I'll define a variable d to equal 2, and then I'll define e to equal the result of d plus 2. Then I'll echo out the value of e, and I'll save, and then I'll run my script. And I see 4, 2 plus 2. We can also use the increment and decrement operators that you might be familiar with. And the combination assignments. e plus equals 5 would increment the value of e by 5. e times equals 3. e divided by equals 3. And e minus equals 5. One thing to watch out for, if you don't have the double parens around an expression, you might end up with string concatenation if you're using plus equals assignment. So if I take the parens off of the e plus equals 5, now we treated that as a string. 4 plus 5 is no longer 9, but 45. And that's not something that I want. There's something else to be aware of with numbers in bash. If I write f equals 1 over 3, and then I run it, I get 0. That's because bash math only works with integers, not floating point numbers. If you need to get a floating point value, you can use the DC program with the predefined math routines to return that. Here I'm using command substitution to echo 1 over 3 piped into bc-l. And then if I run that, I get the result that I'm looking for. You can learn more about the bc command by typing man bc at the command prompt. But suffice to say, if you're doing a lot of math, you probably want to use something other than bash for it. One of the primary reasons you might want to write a script rather than execute commands line by line is to incorporate some logic into what you're doing. For this, comparisons can be very useful. We do this with double square brackets, a notation borrowed from corn shell. It's important to keep spaces between the sets of brackets and the expression. This expression returns 1 or 0 for failure or success. Bash supports the standard complement of comparators, less than, greater than, less than or equal to, greater than or equal to, equal, and not equal. These work within the double square brackets to compare strings. Let's take a look at how these work. I'll test to see if one string is equal to another, and then echo the return value with dollar sign question mark. In this test context, you can use a single or a double equal sign to test for equality. I'll save that, and then I'll run it. And I see the first test for cat equals cat returns 0 for success. And the next one, cat equals dog, returns 1, or failure. I'll jump back into my script, and I'll add another test. Asking if 20 is greater than 100. Now, if I run that, I get back 0. Success. What's going on here? Well, the square brackets are comparing the two values, 20 and 100, as strings. And 2, 0 is a higher value lexically than 1, 0, 0. If I want to test them arithmetically, I have to use a set of operators that tell Bash to compare the terms as numbers instead. For working with integers, we've got the same operations, but the operators are different. A dash and a few letters. 
dash LT for less than, dash GT for greater than, dash LE for less than or equal to, dash GE for greater than or equal to, dash EQ for equality, and dash NE for not equal. Given the difference from other languages, this can take quite a bit of getting used to. And they're changing the operator. I see what I expect. There are also logic operators available in Bash, and with two ampersands, or with two pipe characters, and finally not, with a single exclamation mark. There's also two operators for testing whether a string is null or not null, dash z and dash n. Let's take a look at that. Here I'm using the logical and operator, and using it to ask whether both a is null and b is not null. I'll set a to be an empty string, and I'll set b to be a short string. Then I'll type a test expression, and echo out dollar sign question mark for the return value. I'll save, and I'll run it, and I get zero, success. That's the result of the logical and operator, right here, the two ampersands. And I'm using that to ask whether both A is null and B is not null. One last note, if you're finding examples online, or working with older scripts, you might see a notation with single square brackets. The square bracket is the test command, which was supplemented in bash 2.2 with a double bracket extended test keyword. So now we've got tests that return a value. In the next chapter, we'll put that value to use in conditional statements. Bash provides for string manipulations like concatenation, substring extraction, and replacement. Probably the simplest string manipulation you'll use is concatenation, sticking one string onto the end of another, and it's really straightforward. For this movie, I'll just use the command line instead of a script file. I'll set a equals to hello, and b equal to world. And then to create a string out of both of these put together or concatenated together, I'll define the variable c equal to a and b, just right next to each other. And if I echo that, you can see I have my concatenated string. You can find out how long a string is using a pound or hash sign in front of the variable name. Here I'm using parameter expansion, and you can see when I run that, I get the length of each of those strings, a and c, 5 and 10 characters respectively. You can also ask to just have a certain piece, or a substring, from an existing string, and for that, you'll use a colon followed by an index number to start from. Keep in mind that the first character is at index 0. So I'll define the variable d equal to c colon 3, and then I'll echo out d, and you can see here, I have the substring starting at the third character. I can also ask for a specific number of characters after that position, in this case, starting at character 3 and asking for 4 characters after that and I get back low woe. And if I use a negative number, I can count from the end of the string instead of the beginning. Here, I'm getting four characters at the end of the string. Note that you need to put a space before the dash or it won't work. And here's the first three letters of the last four letters, a chunk of three letters starting from four in from the end of the string. You might use this to extract a date code from a file name, for example, if you know exactly where that date appears in the string. You might also find yourself needing to replace text in a string with some other text. There's a couple ways to go about this. First, I'll define a string. Here, I have the name of the variable I want to work with, in this case the string fruit, followed by one slash, the term I want to replace, in this case banana, another slash, and the string I want to replace the first instance of the search term with, in this case durian. And when I run it, I can see that it replaced the first instance of banana, even though there's two. So what if I want to replace both of those? Well, that's just a minor change, and instead of having one slash right before my search term, I put in two, and it replaces all of the instances of that string. There's a couple modifiers you should know about, too. If you use a number or pound sign in front of the search term in a single replacement, it'll replace the term only if it's the very beginning of the string. In this case, it replaced the very beginning of the string. If I try something that's not, like banana, it leaves my string completely unchanged. If you use a percent sign instead, it'll replace the term only if it's at the end of the string, as you can see here. And if I use it on a term that's not at the end of the string, again, it leaves the string unchanged. Of course, you can use matching with these two. You can see how powerful this is, and you'll probably use it in your scripts quite a bit. You can style text in Bash to draw attention to specific things, or just to make your output a little more interesting. You can do this two ways. The first way is with ANSI escape codes. For this, I'll use the echo command with the dash lowercase e option to enable escape sequences. The escape sequences I'll be using look like this. Cool, but what the heck's going on here? Let's take a look at this in a little bit more detail. The first part, echo-e, like I mentioned earlier, tells echo that I'll be using an escaped string, which are special codes following a backslash or escape character. That lets me do the second part, the escape sequence, which is backslash 0, 3, 3, and a bracket to start, followed by a couple numbers with a semicolon in between them. And that's all followed with a lowercase m to indicate the end of the escape sequence. The numbers represent various formatting options. I'll talk about those in just a minute. Then, following that, I have the string that I'm going to print out, in this case, color text. Then, I have another escape string, bracket 0m. I'll talk about that in a little bit, too. Okay, so the numbers I mentioned correspond to certain styling options, in this case, foreground and background colors. Here's a table of some common options. In this example, I'm using colors. You've got a range of eight colors to work with, black, red, green, yellow, blue, magenta, cyan, and white. 
which you can see isn't as bright as you might expect. These numbers correspond to the color used as the foreground or background color. For example, green is 32 in the foreground and 42 in the background. And here's some examples of what the results could look like. As you can see in each case, I have two numbers separated by a semicolon to set the foreground and background color. There's also the ability to change the style of the text using different numbers. For example, bold is one and blinking is five. Up at the top here, notice that zero is no style. I used that in the example earlier to end the color selection. If I hadn't, anything that followed that string would have been styled as well. So let's say I wanted to write out an error message. I'll use echo dash lowercase e, and then the slash 033 escape code, followed with a bracket, then five for blinking, 31 for red foreground, and 40 for a black background. Then I'll end that string with an M, and I'll write error followed by a colon. So that error text is going to blink, but I don't want the message that I'm going to write to follow it to also be blinking. So I'll use an escape code again, 033, bracket, 0M, and that'll clear out all of the formatting. Next, I want to just have solid red text, so I'll use another escape code, slash 033, and then 31 for red foreground, 40 for black background, and M, and then a message. Something went wrong. And then I'll end the formatting with the clear out escape code, and I'll save this. And I'll run it. I see I made a mistake here. My error should be blinking. So I'll go in and take a look, and yep, and there it is. I have an extra semicolon. With these kind of escape codes, it's really easy to make simple typos. Let's run that again. And there we go. So it's blinking for me. It's red. And then the error message isn't blinking, but it's also red. It's kind of annoying, but it'll definitely catch your attention in an otherwise boring terminal window. So it's a little bit tedious to type this kind of thing over and over in a script. But since we're using bash, we can make it a little bit easier on ourselves using basic string concatenation. I can break out that flashy red code as a variable. And the solid red and the reset string as well. And then I can just use them wherever I need to. So I'll replace that first one with the variable flash red. Then I'll replace the clear out code with none. Then I'll replace the solid red string with the red variable. And I'll make sure that my quoting is right so that this all lines up just the way that I expect it to. And over here, I'll use the none variable again to clear it out for the final time. So now I'll save and I'll run my script. And it looks exactly the same way that it did before. So that could definitely make using this kind of color and styling values in long scripts a whole lot easier. There's another way of specifying this formatting as well, using a utility called tput. This way is a little bit more verbose, but it doesn't involve as many arcane looking escape strings. Let's take a look at those commands. Here's a selection of them, the ones that match up with the options I showed you earlier. The foreground and background styles have numbers from 0 through 7 to specify colors, and I'll show you those in a minute. There are keywords here for the other styles as well, and here's the colors. You'll see here, a particular color, like say green for example, is 2 using the setAF command, and it's also 2 using the setAB command for the background, whereas in the ANSI one, they were different values. I'll switch over to my script, and I'll change it to use the tput notation. And since tput is a command, I'll need to use command substitution. So I'll change flash red using tput setAB for the background color to 0, which is black, a semicolon since I'm using more than one command here at the same time, tput setAF for the foreground color to 1, which is red, and then tink because I want that text to be blinking. Next, I'll change the red one, and I'll do tput set ab0 for black background again, and tput set af1 for red foreground. And then for none, I'll use tput sgr0, which resets all of the styles. So I'll save, and I'll go out here to my script, and it runs exactly the same way. There's a lot of options available for tput, and to check them out, you can take a look at the man page for term info. So if you scroll down to where you see these things like enter dim mode and enter reverse mode, enter standout mode, you'll see that the second column, in this case, dim and rev and smso for standout, those are the values that we were using with the tput command. And you can see all of the options that are available here, and there's a lot of them. I want to take a couple minutes to talk about date and printf. Date is not part of bash, but it's really useful for certain kinds of scripts. The date command gives you a format like this, and you can use a string formatting option, a character plus, followed by a format specifier in quotes, to get pretty much any format you need. Here I've used percent lowercase d, dash, percent lowercase m, dash, percent uppercase y, and that gives me the day, the month, and the year. Here's another one. Percent capital H, dash, percent capital M, dash, percent capital S. And that's the hours, minutes, and seconds of the current time. You can explore all of the other format specifiers on date's man page, and it's a couple pages down. As you can see, there's a whole bunch of things that you can use, and I encourage you to explore those. I'll hit Q to quit out of here. Another handy tool is printf, a built-in that comes with bash, which lets you print out data with a particular format. While you can use echo to lay out text manually, printf gives you a lot more options. Let's take a look at some of them. So I'll start a printf string with printf, and then I'll use name, colon, which is a label that I want, then backslash t, which is a tab character. This is going to help me line up my information. Then I'll use percent s, which is the format specifier for a string, which I'll specify later. 
Then I'll use backslash n, which is a new line character. And then for the next line, I'll use id colon, a label for an id number, another backslash t to keep things lined up, and then percent zero four d. What that does is say, I want to pad this field with zeros to four places, and then I'll specify a number or a series of digits in a little bit. Then I'll use backslash n again for another new line, and I'll use an ending quote. After that, I have a string that I want to pass in for the first percent s, and then a second string, which in this case is the id number. Notice that it's only two characters. I'll run this, and you can see that everything got lined up nicely because of the tab characters. It's broken across a couple lines because of the new line characters, and my ID number is padded with zeros to four digits. I can change that information without having to mess around with the formatter string. So let's put together a little script that uses both of these helpers. I'll define a variable called today using command substitution, using that format string that you saw earlier, and another variable called time, again using the format string you saw earlier, then I'll write a printf string using the option dash v, which assigns the output to a variable, in this case d. I'm using this because command substitution strips out the new lines, and I'm specifying new lines, so I definitely want those to show up in the result. And then I'll put in the values that I want to pass into my string variables. The first one, current user, I'll use the bash variable user, which is the current logged in user. And then today, which is the date for today, and time, which is the current time. And then I'll echo d using quotes to preserve the new lines. And then I'll run my script. And there it is. There's a lot more format specifiers that you can use, and I encourage you to check them out. Here's a list of them on the Bash Hackers website. In a script, you might want to keep track of a collection of things, rather than one-off variables. For that, you can use an array. In Bash, you declare that a variable is an array by enclosing it in parentheses. There's an empty array called A, and an array called B that I'll give three elements. Notice that there aren't commas in between these elements, like there are in a lot of other languages. To retrieve an element inside an array, you use its zero-based notation, along with a variable name, inside of curly braces. So in this case, when I run it, I'll get cherry, because that's the item that's at index 2. Remember that arrays are zero-based. You can also set array values by index number, and you don't have to populate every element. These sparse arrays can be very useful when you need to record data with a particular position in a list, instead of just adding to the end of the array. But if you want to add something to the end of an array, you can use the plus equals operator. Make sure you put the value in parentheses. If you don't do that, Bash will append the value to the zeroth element in the array, so I'd end up with apple, mango, banana, cherry, kiwi. And you probably don't want that. Now, if I want to do that, I'll type echo dollar sign curly brace b and then in square brackets the at symbol, which represents the whole array. I'll save that, and then I'll run it. I can also grab the last element, using the notation that I showed you in the movie about strings. And in this case, that's mango. Now, if you're using bash 4 and above, you can also make associative arrays. That is, you can specify a key and a value. To do this, you'll use the declare keyword clear out my script here, and then I'll type declare, and then dash capital A. I'll call this one my array. If your key or value has a space in it, you'll need to use quotes. And then I can access those values by using the key. In this case, I'll access the value HQ West by using the key office building, and I'll access the value blue by using the key color. And I'll run that. Oh, looks like I've got a problem there. Oh, there it is. Now I'm missing a quote at the end of this key. And there we go. HQ West is blue, both of the values that I set in my associative array. If you're using bash 3 or below, you won't have support for this, so keep that in mind when you're building your script. Arrays don't have a maximum length, and they can be really handy for keeping track of things in your script. Eventually, you'll probably want to work with files. If you want to work with the contents of binary files, you're on your own for that. That's a territory better served by C or something a bit lower level. But working with text files in bash is pretty easy. The greater than and less than symbols are key here. For example, if I write echo, some text, greater than sign, file.txt, bash writes the string, some text, to a file called file.txt, creating it if it doesn't, and overwriting anything that's already in it. You're probably familiar with this from working with output redirection. You can use the greater than operator by itself to zero out a file, getting rid of anything that's inside it. But let's put something back in there. If you want to add onto the end of a file, rather than replace it, you can use two greater than symbols. So what about reading files? Well, for that you can use a while loop, along with the read command. This syntax reads the file file.txt into the variable f line by line. To see this in action, I'll add an incrementing variable and print that out alongside each line. And I'll save this, and I'll run it. And just like I can use a file as an input for a loop, I can also use a file as an input for a command, like a set of instructions. A simple example of this would be to use cat to read a file. But a more interesting use would be to set up a list of instructions to execute automatically. For instance, I'll write a quick text file, and I'll call it ftp.txt. 
So here I've written instructions to connect to one of the mirror servers for Project Gutenberg. This one's hosted on xmission.com. I'm logging in as the user anonymous, and I'm using the password nothing here because the anonymous user doesn't need a password. Then I wrote ASCII. FTP wants to know whether you're going to be using an ASCII or a binary connection. In this case, I'm using ASCII because I know I'll just be transferring text. Then I have cd space Gutenberg because the file that I'm looking for is in the Gutenberg directory, and then I'm issuing the command get gutindex.00, which is just one part of the index. So I'll save this, and then I'll use the FTP command with the dash n option so the FTP respects the user I specified in the file and doesn't try to connect just as whoever I'm logged into my session as. And then I'll use the less than symbol and refer to ftp.txt as the input. And when I list the directory, I see my gutindex.00 file. So you can see, that can be pretty handy. One of the handy features of Bash is what's called a here document. This lets you specify input freely up to a specified limit string, which can be handy for displaying long passages of text in your script, or for specifying options to an interactive command, like reading a command file as we saw earlier in the chapter. So a here document looks like this. I use two less than symbols and a limit string to say, take all of this input and feed it into the given command. In this case, I'm just using cat, up until you see the limit string. Now, obviously that limit string needs to be unique enough that it won't appear as part of whatever you're passing to the command. So I'll save this, and when I run it, I see the text that I entered. This is used a lot for instructions or other long bits of text that would be tedious to echo out line by line. And because of that, there's another option to know about. If I put a dash after the less than symbols, Bash will strip out the leading tabs from the text that follows. And that can help make your script a lot more readable. You could also use the here document as a built-in way to download or upload something that your script uses if you host files on an FTP server. Let's take a look at a previous example, getting part of the index of books from Project Gutenberg. You'll notice a couple minor differences. In this case, I'm getting gutindex.01 since I've already got gutindex.00 in a previous movie. I'm also using the FTP command by to disconnect from the FTP server. If I don't do that, I'll get an error when the script runs. You could wrap this up in a menu option or specify a flag to trigger it. We'll take a look at how to do that later on in the course. But if I save this and run it, it goes out and gets the file. So that's a really handy and powerful option that you can use in your scripts. For this challenge, imagine that you've been asked to create a script that outputs some information about the system to the screen and saves some information to a text file. Use variables, some string manipulation, some text formatting, and some command substitution. You'll also need to use redirection to get information into a file. Of course, there's no right or wrong answer in this challenge, but try to get a few different pieces of information and display them in a nice way. This should probably take you about 20 to 30 minutes. Good luck! My solution to this challenge looks like this. Yours will probably look different, and as long as it returns some information about the system and looks nice, that's just fine. Let's take a look at the script that I built for this. Here at the very top, I have the shebang line, and then I start defining a few variables. The first one is free space, which uses the df command and a couple options to get the free space available on the root volume, which is represented by the backslash. That information is piped into grep with a simple regular expression to match that line, and then that's piped into another utility to print out the specific information that I want to get at. After that, I have green text, bold, and normal, which are three formatting strings that I'll use later on. And then there's a variable called log date. That's using the date command to print out the current date, the four digit year represented by capital Y, the month, and the date. After that, I define a variable called log file, which concatenates together that log date with underscore report.log. So that'll generate the name of a file using today's date. Then I have echo for the first line of my output, and I'm using some of the formatting strings, making the whole string bold. And then I'm using the hostname variable, which comes from bash, to get the hostname of my system, and that's going to be in green. And then at the end of that line, I reset the styles to normal. Then I use printf a couple times, using pretty much the same construction. I have a tab character here at the beginning, and then a label, system type, bash version, free space, and files and directory, and generate it on. And then I have another tab character to keep everything lined up. And then I have a format specifier for string, and then a new line. And so into this first one, into this string, I have mock type, which tells me the machine type, and that comes from bash. In the next line, I have bash version, which is pretty self-explanatory. Then I have free space, which comes from this df command up here, using grep and awk. Then I have a listing of the files in the current directory, which is using command substitution with the ls command, piping into a utility called wc for word count, with the option dash l, which counts the number of lines, which with ls equates to the number of things in the directory. In the next line here, I'm using command substitution as well with the date command, using that format specifier that we saw earlier, to get the date as month, day, and year. And then I have a comment over here. This is the US date format, so if you're in Europe or Africa or Asia, somewhere else that has a different standard date format, you'll probably have a different date format if you've used a date in your script. Then I have echo with a formatted string again, saying that a summary of this information has been saved to the log file. And then I start writing to the log file using a here document, basically passing two lines, terminated by EOF in this case, into cat, and I'm using the dash modifier here so that these tab lines aren't represented in the file that I'm writing out. And then I'm using redirection here to take the output of cat and put that into the log file, which is, as you'll remember, the date underscore report dot log. 
I'm using printf, again, with some format specifiers, to print just a summary of that information that I displayed on the screen out to a file. So I have sys and then the mock type bash for the bash version and then the bash version variable. And you'll notice here I'm using the double greater than symbol so that I don't step on what's in log file, I just add to the bottom of that log file. So that's my script, and then you can see that it's created this date underscore report dot log file, so I can take a look at that with cat, and I see here's the information that I specified. That two lines of text that I used the here document for, and then the two pieces of information that I used printf to print, similar to how I did up here. Remember, the goal of this challenge was to get some practice using bash to solve a problem. An if statement executes an if statement executes code based on the truth value of a given expression. In Bash, that's an if followed by a statement, usually in single or test brackets, or extended test or double square brackets. Or it can be contained within double parentheses for an integer comparison, or have no brackets at all, whatever is appropriate for the comparison you're doing. That's followed up with a semicolon and the word then. Or you can drop the semicolon and put then on its own line. After then goes whatever you want to execute if the expression is true. Optionally, you can specify an else condition, which executes if the tested expression evaluates as false. And you close the if statement with fi, if, backwards. If you need to do additional evaluation within an else block, you can use the elif or elif statement with its own then, since it's another evaluation. Let's take a look at how you might use this in a script. I'll open up my working file, my.sh, and I'll set a equal to 5, and then I'll use an if statement with integer comparison. And then I'll echo a is greater than 4, if a is in fact greater than 4, otherwise I'll echo a is not greater than 4. And then I'll close the if with fi. So I'm testing if 5 is greater than 4. 5 is, in fact, greater than 4, so I see the message that I specified when the condition is true. I can edit the script and flip that around, and we'll change that to 2. And then I'll run this, and I see 2 is not greater than 4. Well, that's right. You can also use an if statement with a regular expression to test if a string matches what you're looking for. For that, I'll use the extended test notation with the double brackets. I use the equals tilde operator here to indicate a regular expression. And then I use the very basic regular expression square bracket 0 dash 9 square bracket to look for a digit and then plus to say one or more of these. Regular expressions are very powerful and I encourage you to check out Using Regular Expressions with Kevin Skoglund here on lynda.com for more in-depth information about them. Now I'll change my echo lines since those don't make sense anymore. And here I'm using Control K to cut lines. So I'll save this and I'll run it and I get the result I'm looking for. Of course, I can change that by putting a number in the string this is my number one string now. And now it sees that there are numbers in the string because it matched the condition for my regular expression. So checking to see if something's true or not is only good up to a certain point. To make it even more useful, let's use it in a loop. We don't always want to have a loop work on a specific range of values. We might want a loop to continue while some condition is true or false, or until some condition occurs. For that, there's the while and until loops. First, let's look at the while loop with a simple example that counts up to 10. Here, I'm using both the integer comparison to loop while i is less than or equal to 10, and doing a little bit of arithmetic to increment the value of i by 1. You'll notice that the syntax here is basically the same as the if statement, which of course makes sense because we're asking for an evaluation, that is, whether i is less than or equal to 10, and if it evaluates true, then we do everything within the loop, and then at the end of the loop is the word done. I'll save it and run, and I see the numbers 0 through 10. The until loop is the counterpart to the while loop. Here I am echoing the value of j until j is greater than or equal to 10. And when I run it, I see that the loop ran until j was equal to 10. Keep in mind, both of these can cause infinite loops, so be careful to check your logic. Now let's take a look at the for loop. A for loop sets up a loop based on particular criteria, usually a sequence or a range of things. With it, we get a variable that contains the current value with each iteration. Here's a simple example. So a for loop looks like this. It starts with 4, and then it has a variable, in this case i, it contains the current variable each time that it steps through the list. Then the word in, and then whatever list of things you're going to use, in this case, one, two, three. Then the statement do, followed by anything you want to do with the current value at that iteration of the loop. And then that's all ended up with done. So in this case, this will echo out one, two, three. So let's see that. And there it is. So this could get really tedious if we want to use a large range, say from one to 100. So for that, we could use brace expansion. So this will list all the numbers from one to 100. And there it goes. So already, this syntax has saved me a whole lot of typing. In bash 4 and above, I can specify an interval, and there we go, counting by twos. Another variation of this for loop is available too, which might look familiar to you if you've worked with a C-style language. Setting a variable equal to some starting value, and then a test to see if that variable meets a certain criteria, and then some operation on that variable, usually an increment or a decrement. So I'll save this, and I'll run that. 
Of course, you can loop through an array as well. Get rid of that line with Control K, and I'll specify a simple array. And then I'll set up my for loop, for i in, and then using parameter expansion here, I'll read the array. Then I'll run my script, and there's each of the items in the array. Working with an associative array is a little bit different, and again, remember, this will only work on bash 4 and above. Again, I'll get rid of those lines using Control K to cut the lines, and then I'll declare an associative array. And I'll start populating that array. I'll have a key called name, and I'll set the value to my name. And I'll have a key called ID that I'll just set to some value. And then in the for loop, I start it just like normal, but instead there's something a little bit different going on. I'm using an exclamation mark to access the keys in the associative array. And since my keys are strings, they could have spaces in them, so I'm using quotes to accommodate that. So when I loop th through, the variable I contains the key. And so I need to modify my echo statement to get the value of the array that corresponds to that key. So here I'm echoing the value of the key, and then I'm echoing the value as referenced by the key in the array. So I'll save that, and I'll run it, and there it is. I have a listing of the key and the value for each of the key value pairs that I specified. So finally, let's take a look at using command substitution. If I type for i in, and then use command substitution just to do something basic in this case, like ls, this uses the output of the ls command as a series of things for the for loop to loop through. So if I run that, I see each of the items in my folder. Of course, there are much better ways of running the ls command, but this shows how easy it is to integrate some logic with the operations you use at the command line. So what if you have a number of different things you want to test for? Well, you could use a long series of if statements, but there's a better way, the case statement. Case checks a value against a series of values you provide, and it shows up pretty often in conjunction with scripts that take an argument to control an outcome. I'll talk about those in more depth in the movie about arguments. I'll set a variable a equal to dog. Now, a case statement starts out with the word case, followed by the variable you're testing, and then the word in. Then on the next line, I'll put a condition to test. This will test if the value of a is equal to cat, and a right parenthesis to indicate the end of that test. That's followed up by whatever I want to do when the value matches, in this case, echo feline, and then two semicolons to tell Bash that you're done with that test. And you can just keep adding test conditions. You can use a pipe character to specify a list of things to match. This will match dog or puppy, and if nothing matches, there's a way to catch that as well, using the asterisk. To close the case statement, I'll use ESAC, case spelled backwards. Now I'll save, and I'll run the script. I see canine, which is the response I expect, because the variable a is set to dog. If I go in and change that to cat, I get feline. And if I change it to bird, that doesn't match any of the conditions, so I get that fall-through response. Obviously, using a case statement is handy for menus and working with user input, and you'll see more about that in a little bit. During your script development, you may find yourself repeating code blocks. It's a good practice to not repeat yourself if you don't have to, and it's a whole lot more maintainable to keep things organized. Bash functions can help out with that. To declare one, just type the keyword function and the name of your function, followed by curly braces. Inside the function goes whatever you want to happen when the function is called. And then, to call the function, just call it by name. I'll save that and go out to the command line to run it. And there's hi there, echoed by calling the function greet. And of course, the contents of these functions can be as complex as you like, but there's one more thing that functions are great for. Wrapping up code that will process some value that you give the function. To do that, you pass one or more arguments to the function. That's accomplished by putting values right after the function call. And up here in the function, I'll make a little bit of a change. I need to accommodate a name, and I'll use the variable $1, which represents the first argument passed into a function. Now if I save and run the script, I see my name passed into the function. Great. Now I said that $1 represents the first argument passed, and you've probably already figured out there's a $2, $3, and more. Well, if you go to 10 or above, you'll have to put that number in curly braces, but you get the picture. So I'll change the output of my function to accommodate another variable, and I'll pass some more arguments into the function. And if I run that, I get the response that I expect. But maybe I have a list of things that I want to run through my function, like the output of a list command. Let's make some space here, and I'll define a new function called number things. So there's a lot going on here. First, I'm declaring a function called number things, and then setting i to 1. Then I'm using a for loop for f in dollar sign at, which is a special array variable that represents all of the arguments passed to a function. Then I'm saying echo i colon f, which on each loop around is going to be the next item in that dollar sign at array of arguments. Then I'm incrementing i by 1 and finishing the loop. Down below I call the function number things, and I'm using the shell expansion to get the results of command ls, which will contain the name of all the files and folders in the current directory. This could just as easily be a list of things as you'd find them in an array. And I'll run that. Cool, now we're starting to get somewhere.
Until now, I've been writing self-contained scripts that don't accept any input, but in the real world, chances are you'll want to get some kind of information from the user to use in your script. For this, you'll use arguments. If you're following along, you'll see that these arguments are exactly the same as they were when you're working with functions. If you're just joining in, I'll start with a little bit of review. Arguments are a special type of variable that are specified by the user when the script is run. These could be pretty much anything, a file or folder you want to create or work with, a username, or a string of text to search for. They're passed into the script by typing them after the script name. Arguments are represented by numbered variables, and they're assigned in the order that they're provided at the command line. So the first argument is assigned to $1. And let's take a look at that. Here I'm using Apple as the first argument, and since I'm echoing out the first argument in my script, I see Apple. The second variable would be $2, etc. And just like a regular variable, anything with a space in it would need to have quotes around it. That's pretty useful for a couple of arguments. But what if I wanted to deal with any number of arguments, rather than creating a variable for each one manually? Well, Bash gives us an array of arguments, which I can get to with $at, and I can use a for loop to walk through it. There's also a variable, $pound, which contains the number of arguments. Let's run that. And you can see that that will accommodate an arbitrary number of arguments, apple, orange, banana, kiwi, lemon, and it counted them up and there were five. So I didn't have to define a variable for each one of those, which definitely saves a lot of time. If you've been working with the bash command line environment for a while, you're bound to have come across flags. There are specific options that you can use to pass information into a program, and they usually start with a dash. You can make use of these in your bash scripts by way of the get opts function. Let's say I wanted to make a script that accepts a username and password. I could certainly use arguments for this, but then I'd need to make sure that the username and password were entered in a certain order. Let's take a look at how to set this up. With a while loop, using the getOps function, I'll specify an opt string, which defines what flags I'm looking for. Here, I'll use u colon p colon, which means that I'm looking for a dash u and dash p. So I'm using the case statement using option as a variable, and when that option matches u, it sets user equal to optarg, which is the value that's passed in from the user following dash u at the command line. The same thing happens for dash p. So let's take a look at this running. and I see that the values that I wanted were assigned. One of the handy things about flags is that they don't have any particular order. Now there's a couple other things you can do with the opt string. This string, like I have it, with the colons after each flag, means that I expect there to be a value along with each flag. Dash u username, dash p password. But if I add other flags without colons after them, that means that I just want to know whether or not that flag was used. So I'll add a and b there, and then I'll update my case statement. And I'll run this first without any flags, and then with one of the flags, dash A, and I see got the A flag. I can also do that with B, or got the B flag, and I can do both, got the B flag, got the A flag. There's another change that I can make to the opt string. Adding a colon at the beginning tells Bash that I want to know about flags that were used at the command line that I haven't specified, and in the case statement, I'll use question mark to capture that. I'll save it, and then if I run it using an option that I didn't specify, I see that message. I don't know what Z is. And that's how you work with flags. So you just saw how to get user input at the command line, but sometimes it's not practical to have all of the values you're looking for specified when you run the script. Luckily, there's a way to get input during the execution of a script. I'll write a typical question and then write read name. The read keyword pauses the script to wait for input, followed by return or enter, and it stores that input in the variable you specified. Here, I've used name. There are also some options that read can accept. Let's ask for a password, and here I'll use read-s, followed by a variable name. The dash s means silent, which means that it won't show the characters that I type in. I can also write everything on one line, with a dash p option, which writes out a prompt before the input area. And let's echo all that out, just to see what's going on. And if I run this, first I'm prompted for my name, and then my password, which you can see is not appearing when I type, and then our inline prompt. What's your favorite animal? I like cats. And now you can see the values that were collected. There are some other options as well, and I encourage you to explore them if you need more flexibility in your script. There's another way of getting input as well, in a handy menu form. Let's make some room here. And for that, I'll use the keyword select. Select is followed by the variable name that you want to store the selection in, in this case, animal. And then the word in, followed by a list of the options to select from. After that comes a do block, and that will encapsulate whatever you want to do with the selection. It's important to break out of the loop when you have a response, otherwise the loop will continue forever. So I'll save this and then I'll run it at the command line. And you can see I get a very nice numbered list of words and a prompt to enter a number. When I pick a number, I get back the string associated with it. 
course, this kind of input pairs very nicely with the case function to respond to the user selection. Let's change the selection list a little bit, and I'll add a quit item. And then here inside the do block, I'll add a case statement. I'll change the variable name here as well to make a little bit more sense. Then I'll add a case block. Here I've got options cat, dog, and quit, and in the case block I respond to each of those selections. And then I have a fall-through condition in case the user enters something that doesn't match an option that I've provided. Let's see what this looks like when it runs. I'll type the number 1, and even though I didn't type the word cat, the case statement is matching that term because it was provided by the select statement. It asks for input again, and I'll type 2 for dog. And I get back a similar response. I'll type 3 for quit, and it quits because I said to break for that option. So that's all pretty straightforward and easy to implement in your own script. While it's great to ask for input, you probably want to build some error tolerance into your scripts. What happens if someone skips a prompt by just pressing enter? There's a few ways to deal with this pretty easily. First, let's take a look at a case where we have a script that requires arguments to run. So this script checks for the number of arguments, and because it wants to have three, it won't run the program if it doesn't. Instead, it returns a usage recommendation, instead of just exiting or failing somewhere along the road when it comes time to use an argument that wasn't provided. I'll save this, exit, and run the script. Since I haven't provided any arguments, I get the usage recommendation. If I provide just a few arguments, the condition of having three arguments is still not satisfied, so I get the usage recommendation again. But if I give it three arguments, which is what it's looking for, then the program executes. Alternatively, we could set up a loop to not allow the user to continue without specifying some kind of input. This uses the dash Z option in the evaluation to check that the variable, in this case A, is not empty. Let's take a look at how this works. I'll save, and then I'll run. Favorite animal? I'll answer cat and it says cat was selected. So if I run that again, and I press enter, instead of having an error, the script prompts me for an answer. And I can continue like this until I decide to finally answer. And then when I do, it continues the program. But that can get kind of needy and irritating. So instead, what you might do is assume a default answer if the user skips the question by pressing enter. This can also be handy for streamlining scripts, where input is probably going to be a predetermined value, but where you want to give the user the option to change it on the off chance that it needs to be different. So I'll edit the script that we have, and in the prompt, I'll add what the answer is going to be assumed to be if the user presses enter here cat in brackets. That's something you'll see a lot, an assumed answer in brackets. And then inside the while loop, instead of asking a question again, I'll just set the variable to what I told the user that it would be set to, in this case, a equals cat. So I'll save this and clear up the screen here. And then I'll run the script. Favorite animal? And if I hit enter, the script just continues along, making the assumption that cat was going to be selected anyway. So if I run it, I can also put in other input, like fish, for example. And then fish becomes the value of a, and that can be used in the script later. You can also do some basic validation of input, rejecting input that doesn't match a regular expression. Here, I'm asking for a year, and then using a regular expression to test whether the input does not match it. In this case, I'm looking for four digits from zero through nine. I'm also giving the user an affordance of what I'm looking for. In this case, four ends in brackets to say that I'm looking for four numbers. So if I save and I run this script, it prompts me, what year? Well, what about the year 300? I didn't like that very much. So I could put in 0, 300, and it likes that. Or if I run the script again, and put in what year? Last year doesn't like that either, so I'll have to put in 2012. And since that matches the regular expression, it continues. Checking for input that matches parameters you expect can help to avoid errors later on in your code. For this challenge, let's build a little game. Make a script that takes interactive input from the user to guess a random number. Use a loop and a condition to check if the answer is right, and keep asking if it isn't. Make the script respond to having an argument, and give it some functionality if there isn't an argument provided as well. And finally, make sure to use a function in your script. This should take about 20 minutes. Good luck! So here's my result. If I just run my script with no argument, I get a random number. And if I use the argument game, I get this fun guessing game. I'll guess one. Nope, that's not right. Two, nope, three, there it is, six. I only got that on my sixth try. I must be great at guessing. Let's take a look at the script. Up here at the top, I've got the shebang line. And then I set the variable rand equal to the bash random variable. So every time the script runs, that'll generate a new value. And then I set the variable secret equal to the very first character in the string for random. I don't want my users having to guess a four or five digit random number, so I'm just taking the first digit off of the string that bash generates for me. Let's go down to the bottom first. So here, I'm asking if $1, which is the first argument, matches game lowercase or game with a capital G or game all in capital letters. If it does, then I call the function game. If not, I call the function generate. So let's take a look at those functions. The game function asks me to guess a random one digit number, and then it stores that value in the variable guess. Then I have a while loop to compare the value of guess to the value of secret. If it's not equal, I'll ask for another try. When the guess does equal the secret, the while loop is done, and I echo, good job. Then further down here, we have the generate function, which gets called if there's no argument at the command line. It shows me the random number, and it also gives me this formatted string as a hint, in case I forget what argument this takes. 
So that's what I came up with, and I hope you came up with something fun as well. There are a lot of fantastic resources out there for beginner, intermediate, and advanced bash users. And one of the best is the bash manual itself, which you can get to in your terminal window using the command man bash. Or you can find it online. There's a community at Bash Hackers with a lot of great guides and information as well. The Linux documentation project has a detailed list of gotchas or things to watch out for, along with code examples to describe them. If you run into problems or have a question you can't find the answer to in the documentation, Stack Overflow is a great option. I hope you had as much fun with